All right. Thank you, Thomas. Again, apologies for uh, screwing up the schedule of the conference. Um, I know how to save uh, with a safe laptop, but not how to get myself safely here. So uh, that's probably the next lesson for me to learn. Um, so the topic today is a reasonably safe travel burner laptop. Um, and the idea is basically, you know, you have all uh, heard these stories about uh, laptops, getting implants and so on. So you want to have something that you can trust a little bit when you travel. Um, it's still cheap enough to throw away after your travel, but you know sometimes you want to get something into a country like a presentation or something or even uh, more sensitive data, um, and then you need a solution to bring it to the country that's um, so that you know the people where you bring it to don't know everything about your laptop already, right? Um, as Thomas introduced me, my name is Georg Wisiewski. I work with CrowdStrike, which is a small American company um, focusing on threat intelligence. And um, yes, let's let's just dive into the talk. Um, so let's start with the motivation a little bit, uh, some, some stories and so on. Um, I guess uh, Stefan is here, he talked yesterday, and some people might have seen last year on Twitter, he was posting uh, pictures from his laptop, from his hotel room, uh, where there were screws missing and so on, so evidently somebody was trying to do something to his laptop on his, his hotel room. Um, but uh, there is, a, is another story um, that I got told uh, recently that was kind of funny. Uh, a couple of years ago, somebody was going um, to enter uh, into the United States for attending the Black Hat and DEF CON conferences. And uh, unfortunately, entering the country for him, as he did not have the awesome German passport that makes it very easy to enter all the countries, um, was not so seamless for him. And he got taken his laptop away for um, x-raying the laptop, you know. Um, if you already were on the plane and you, know, you, you enter the country, you think maybe my laptop is fine. Oh, no, they take it away for another three hours for x-raying it, right? And <laughs> then you can make up your mind, uh, why does it take three hours to x-ray a laptop and, and so on? But your laptop is gone for three hours and you don't know what's happening to it, right? Um, so that's kind of the, the motivation. An x-ray shouldn't take three hours. Probably they have to x-ray a lot of laptops and it sits in a queue or maybe it's just not being x-rayed, right? Um, and then, of course, you have the problem. You probably need to x-ray your laptop yourself then because you, don't, you want to see what happened to it, um, except that it's probably cheaper to just throw it away. <coughs> And of course, um, you know, with all the Snowden revelations, um, many people saw this. Um, I'm sorry if yes, anybody with a US clearance. I'm sorry that I'm showing you these slides. Uh, you can go out now. Um, so um, there were these, these uh, uh, yeah, catalog published, the AND catalog, which is their internal product portfolio, the implants that they offer, and so on. And uh, what you hear, uh, see here is uh, two implants they offer for uh, putting in onto laptops. There's a, a software implant, which is basically just a, a MBR modification um, that allows uh, staging secondary payloads like, uh, you know, a Trojan or whatever uh, from the MBR. So even if you clean it from your operating system, um, it's still in the MBR. And in case, you know, antivirus, uh, and uh, you have an antivirus that even checks and cleans your MBR, uh, they even went a step further and uh, modifi modified your um, system hard disk firmware so that it only presents an infected MBR during the boot phase. And after that, uh, the hard drive pretends to have a clean MBR from there on. So it's even more hard to clean your, your laptop. And of course, these things are um, something that could be installed by remote software exploitation. But if somebody is coming into the country for Black Hat anyway, it's much, much easier to just you know, x-ray his laptop for three hours um, and take this time to refresh the hard drive firmware and get access to the data this way. And the big drawback here, of course, is even if you have full disk encryption, you're going to unlock your hard disk at some point. And they don't need an unlocked hard disk to deploy this because they're just refreshing the hard drive firmware. So what they can basically do is your laptop is locked and encrypted. They add this uh, implant and then they just wait for you to unlock your laptop yourself and then they don't even need to know your passwords. I mean probably they will still record it but they get access to the unencrypted data because you unencrypted for them. So um, this is uh, of course only the American example. I don't want to bash on the Americans. Uh, I'm pretty sure that other countries um, do it. There's a record actually of Germany doing this uh, at the border in customs. Um, there was a public case about this where they um, did it for criminal investigation into drug trafficking where they actually implanted with a software implant only a laptop of a drug trafficker at the customs at the border entering Germany. 
And um, those are only the Germans and the Americans now, but I'm sure that you know other countries um, have these capabilities as well and use these capabilities. Because if somebody enters the country, it's very, very convenient because people are used to the hassle and so on. Um, it's much less convenient to enter a hotel room, but if that needs to be done, it's of course still not a big feat for them, right? Especially for people like us nerds, we're not gonna, even if we see somebody in our hotel room, we are gonna not you know, beat them up, right? <coughs> okay. Um, there is some existing solutions uh, and secure ecosystems already for secure booting and trusted la laptops, trusted platforms, and so on and so on. The most famous one is, of course, of course iOS, which you know has a very high bar for jailbreaking these days. There are millions of dollars being paid to getting just you know uh, code execution and, and reboot persistence, but iOS is not very you know productive operating system, right? Um, you cannot do much on an iPhone or, or uh, iPad. Um, the other one that's really, really nice is uh, Chrome OS from, from Google. Um, they ha also have a pretty tight boot chain and, and platform integrity measures, but the, it's the same problem again. You, have, uh, you end up with a Chrome OS uh, browser, basically, and then you can use everything from the Google Cloud, which means you, know, you have to trust Google and you need to have internet access to the Google Cloud in the country that you're in and so on, which is not uh, very useful again. But I mean, there are these solutions that, that are out there. And then, of course, there is UEFI Secure Boot, which uh, applies to Windows. Um, but there have been so many vulnerabilities in UEFI that it's not very trustworthy for your platform integrity, right? I think every conference in, or every major conference in the last two years had a talk like owning UEFI and getting code execution in SS SMM through UEFI bugs and so on. So that's not very trustworthy. Um, and there are some obscure Intel technologies like Intel Boot Guard and so on that uh, are interesting because they offer you interesting uh, possibilities for securing you from uh, reset vectors so from stage zero of laptop code execution up to your operating system. But the problem there is um, you need to be a big UEM manufacturer um, to get access to these, these technologies um, and Intel won't, you know, let me talk to them, say like, hey, I want to secure my own laptop. Uh, how can I use your technology for that? And also, um, most of these things are um, under NDA with OEMs and so on because they want to protect the inte uh, intellectual property. So. What, what is it that I wanted to do, right? I wanted to have something that is open source um, because at least it's hypothetically auditable. We have seen with OpenSSL that open source doesn't actually mean that anybody looks at the source code, but you could. Um, we still want something that's a sheep to throw away. Um, there have been these Librem laptops uh, from Purism that got some publicity. They're actually, it's marketing hype. They're not actually that free. Um, as free in, in, in blob free, no binary code. There's still a lot of stuff for drivers where you need binary blobs. Um, but also they're over $1,000. And um, uh, my, my goal was I want to stay under $300 because that's my personal mark where I say, I can still throw it away after a trip uh, if I suspect some compromise. I mean, uh, in some companies, the C-level executives, they get a shiny new MacBook for every trip, but I'm not a C-level executive, so nobody pays that for me. Um, and the goal should also be a somewhat diversified ecosystem. Um, and what I mean by this is not everybody has the same secure travel laptop. Everybody builds his own. Um, it's slightly different, um, but that makes it much harder for an attacker uh, to actually attack this, this class of travel laptops because if they're all the same, you have one solution that fits all. If everybody builds the same, um, even maybe makes one or two mistakes, that's actually good because then everyone is a unique snowflake, so to say, um, which is a little bit harder to attack, right? And then again, um, since it's open source and this goes in the same direction, you can add your own unique personalized elements. So you can actually see this is my travel laptop or not one of the same laptops with a different firmware or something where somebody swapped the laptop for me, right? So that's, that's the general idea here and, and the motivation. <coughs> So let's, let's talk about how I approach this problem um, and, and the hardware limitations and so on. Um, the basic... Uh, thing that you have to decide when you when you build something like this is where is the root of my chain of trust right at some point you have to make to have some assumptions right for example this is actually the same physical laptop that I brought and not something entirely different that only looks the same, right? Um, you have to have some kind of threat model. And for me, I decided for this project, the, the root of the chain of trust will be the SPI flash in there. So uh, there's a little ch uh, flash chip that's also known as ROM, and there's a lot, uh, some different names for it, which basically contains your BIOS and so on, right? Um, which is um, not on your, on your um, 
hard disk, it's on a flash chip, so you could still replace this for chip, for example, you can desolder it and solder in another chip, but that's a little bit more work and more custom than, you know, just flashing a new firmware with an appliance. And so that's going to be, in, in this talk, the root of the chain of trust. Um, and on this SPI flash, there will be Coreboot, which is an open source BIOS. I'm going to go into this as well. Um, there's Scrub 2, a Linux bootloader, um, which additionally has modules for uh, full disk encryption and key verification of everything that comes from there. And then the second stage is as in a classical booting setup on your SSD or hard drive. Because, of course, you want to be able to, you know, update your kernel, you want to be able to change something in your operating system. Uh, but because we have uh, the bootloader um, actually in the SPI flash itself, so Grub lives on the firmware flash where only normally the BIOS lives, you can actually have full disk encryption of your entire hard disk, including the boot partition, if you want. Um, and then the other thing is that um, the BIOS, uh, or the SPI flash, contains your own signing key already. So everything that's loaded from your, uh, from your SSD or hard disk is actually RSA signed, including your kernel, including your init RAMFS that contains modules and so on. So you have basically code signing for the first stages uh, from your hard drive, which is, you know, usually the approach for, for adding uh, um, an implant to your laptop is remove the hard drive, reflash the firmware on the hard drive, or just mount the hard drive and add, add in software implant this way. But everything on the hard drive is being signed now, and see, uh, signatures are verified. So if they actually uh, want to attack this approach, then um, they have to reflash the uh, ROM chip on your main board, which is, you know, um, a little bit more cumbersome, right? Um, of course, they could still do this, and um, this is why uh, you can do, if you want, some hardware modifications even to your uh, chip. These uh, ROM chip, they have a uh, write protection, but the write protection can be lifted again if you attach to it with actual physical wires, because there's a pin that is called write protect, so to say, and if you raise that write protect pin to VCC through the input voltage, then actually even if you set write protection, um, non-volatile write protection, um, you can still remove that again. And that's basically so people don't, you know, have to throw away their flash chips. Even if they set write protection at some point, you can still physically repair it. Um, there's two simple solutions to make it a real read-only chip. Well, the first one is set the write protection and then cover it in loads of epoxy. Um, then they actually have to, you know, remove the epoxy, which will probably destroy your mainboard. Um, and the other one is that actually you can um, physically remove the write protect pin because on the mainboards I looked at, I borrowed a logic analyzer. That pin is never used during normal boot. Uh, it would only be used by an attacker trying to make your uh, uh, flash chip read right again. So uh, if you have like a small milling tool, you can cut off this pin and mill it away and then you get a very cheap real read-only chip. Um, or you can actually go to these flash ROM um, um, and SPI flash manufacturers. They sell also chips that are really read-only from some point on. Um, but those are much, much more expensive. If you buy these uh, uh, flash chips in bulk, they're maybe five to ten cents a piece. And the real, the ones that you can make really read-only in bulk, they start at two or three dollars. And if you actually buy a single one, you're going to pay twenty dollars or more. So it's much cheaper to actually just, you know, remove that single pin. And then you actually have a read-only chain of trust. That's the point here, right? Even if they come with an with a external hardware flasher, screw open your laptop and try to flash it, they, they cannot flash it. Um, of course, they can desolder it and replace it with another flash chip and then add uh, their stuff on the new flash chip. But this is something that you cannot do in three hours anymore. This is something, because we're talking about unique snowflakes here, so to say, this is an approach for them that would take them, including reverse engineering of your firmware and so on, this could take them, I give four or five days. Somebody takes your laptop away for four or five days, then, you know, you throw it away. Um, so it makes it more detectable, right? And of course you can do additional stuff like putting nail polish on screws and so on and so on, so you can actually see if they open, uh, open your mainboard. <coughs> so the target hardware that I, I'm targeting, as I said, it should be cheap. Uh, and I don't want to, you know, make commercials for any specific vendor, but I chose to use the Acer C700, uh, 720 and C740. I have one of these here. Um, 
they you can buy them used on eBay in Germany for 100 US dollars. And if you buy them new, then you get them for 250 US dollars. The great thing about Chromebooks basically is you get so many of them in great condition on eBay because there's so many people selling them on eBay like, oh, I bought this one and then I saw it doesn't have Windows. So <laughs> you can get them in great condition because they turn them on and see, oh, this is, this is Chrome something bullshit. Um, and then they sell them on eBay so you can get them relatively cheap. Um, and the same thing is if you uh, buy them off eBay from a private person, um, some people may have seen the, the uh, US intelligence community supply chain interdiction, right? So if you buy uh, an, a MacBook from Apple and it gets shipped to you, they actually you know, tap into this purchasing process and interdict the shipment to you. So they will actually get the laptop before it arrives at your home for the first place. If you buy something off eBay, it's very, you know, uh, less likely that they will interdict the shipment uh, from eBay. And also, you know, an eBay person can ask, hey, when did you ship it? And so on. So it's, you know, uh, much more custom again. Um, so these laptops, they are not really great. They have uh, two gigabytes of RAM. You can get four gigabyte models in the US, but yeah, I don't, I don't live in the US. Um, and the RAM is soldered to the mainboard, so it's not easy to upgrade. And they have crappy CPUs as well. Um, Celeron based CPUs. Um, they have i3 models in the US again, um, but uh, it's said that Core Boot doesn't actually work really well on the i3 based um, models. And the big uh, disadvantage here is that these Celerons, they don't have the AES hardware um, extensions, so actually full disk encryption is um, not too slow, but it's a bigger drain on your battery than if you have hardware support. Um, at least they come with uh, normal M2 SSDs, so these are easy to upgrade. So if you're not happy with the 16 or 32 gigabyte of, of storage, um, getting one of these uh, a compatible uh, 128 gigabyte SSD is only like $20, $30, so that's easy to upgrade. Um, and yeah, as I said, they're really cheap. They also don't have the greatest feeling, so they don't compare to like a ThinkPad, for example, in terms of feeling, it's all plastic and so on, but it's, it's good enough, and they're uh, lightweight and slim. Um, and yeah, this is the mainboard of the C720. Um, as you can see, it's a small mainboard, actually. It's one system on a chip, and it's mostly a battery there. And then, of course, you have here uh, the flash chip, right? Um, so this is actually, here is the flash chip. And um, this is what you would clip onto as an external attacker with a, a pin, right? And um, I believe this is the right protect pin, if I'm not mistaken, with the, with the orientation of the chip right now. So this is what you could then remove physically, um, which I didn't obviously in this case, um, to make it impossible even with an external flash programmer to attach to this chip. But as you can see, it's a tiny chip, so you need to have a, a specialized clip to attach to it or spend more time soldering probes to it and so on. It's not that quickly to do, maybe not in three hours. Um, and the C740 looks pretty much the same. There's very few differences. They basically took the same design, upgraded the processor, and then just uh, make sure it works with the same processor. Also, the uh, flash chip pretty much looks the same. Um, and this is also uh, what you will reprogram with your own firmware to make the setup, right? Okay, so um, other stuff in terms of hardware that you need. You need an external SPI flasher because um, you can reflash your firmware from inside the operating system for Chromebooks if you remove a special screw. But um, you can do this exactly once, right? And if you, <laughs> if you screw that up, then you cannot get a second try because you cannot boot into the operating system to get a second attempt. Um, I started with an external SPI flasher um, with a bus pirate, which is a very uh, widely available tool. Um, but uh, it takes uh, more than 30 minutes to do one uh, read, write, read cycle for verification of the whole flash. Um, and the main limitation of the bus pirate is that it basically goes over, over uh, serial, right? It has a USB serial emulation, and that's very, very slow, and that's the bottleneck. Um, the SPI protocol that is used to speak to the chip can actually be uh, spoken at a much, much higher uh, frequency. So. Um, I went looking around and I found this uh, from Adafruit, this FTDI chip breakout board, the FT232H, which is a very awesome tool. It's only 15 euro and you can speak UART, SPI, I2C and so on all over USB at high frequencies. And um, this is a great uh, 
high-speed programmer for Flash. So it takes two minutes now to do one full read cycle, write cycle, and another read cycle to do verification. So very quick to, to reprogram. And then I went to uh, AliExpress um, and got for six euro, you can get these uh, clips actually to uh, clip onto the chip and you don't have to solder anything at all. Um, it's just, you know, attaching wires to it and if you actually have to do uh, a lot of flashing, I recommend getting one of these like more expensive Pomona clips. They're about thirty dollars, because uh, they last much longer. The AliExpress one, they like after twenty flashing attempts or some or twenty reattachments, the the uh, springs weren't that tight anymore and so on. So I got the new one, and then you need just some arbitrary three point three volt power supply. Um, that you can use to power on the, the flash chip only um, if you have to remove the laptop power and battery because otherwise the embedded controller of the laptop will be powered on and so on and you will all be fighting over the SPI bus so it's a lot easier to do external power supply and then for your reference if you get the slides later um, there's a flash RAM command that you can actually use with this specific breakout board uh, to flash the chip right <coughs> And this is, uh, this is basically uh, how my setup looked. Um, I, I really don't like touching hardware. I'm a software guy, right? And I'm uh, afraid of soldering. I'm afraid of breaking stuff. And um, it doesn't have to be beautiful. What I'm trying to say here is anybody can do this, right? This is just some jumper wires that you put on the clip and so on, and some connections. Um, and um, it's, it's not hard, right? I, I, when I started this, I was like, oh, flash ROMs and BIOS programming, this sounds all very difficult, but really isn't difficult. That's like the, the core point of this talk. Any, anybody, so to say, can do this. Um, and what I found even more impressive is when I t started talking to core boot developers, how do you do debugging, right? Because it's not like you can print on the screen. The BIOS runs before the... I mean, before even the memory of the system is initialized. You don't have uh, random access memory, you don't have a scream and so on. It turns out actually, in a stroke of luck, some of the core boot developers was looking exactly this chip family um, for doing de uh, debugging over UART, over serial, over USB. And it's, it's insane. So basically, uh, the core boot BIOS code, it contains a USB host driver for this specific chipset that will then speak serial on the on the serial port of, of this breakout board. Um, and you have to imagine this, right? This is before the memory is initialized. So before your laptop actually has memory, they already speak USB and you can get a serial output from, from core boot, which is pr kind of impressive and very, very useful, of course, for debugging, right? Um, and this works over the so-called EHCI debug port. So there's a, on each uh, laptop, uh, EHCI bus, USB bus, um, host controller, there's one specific port that is designated the debug port. And this specific port can be programmed um, uh, only without interrupts and so on, only with port I.O. So this is a much easier to, you don't have to do like have a memory and so on, you just send bytes towards the ports and so on. And this can then be used on this specific USB port. And there's actually one dedicated physical port that you have to find out which one. And I documented here for the Chromebooks one, which one it is. Um, that you can only use the, this, you know, low, uh, low mode on there. And then you can build with another generic UART to USB converter. You can kind of build a null modem cable, serial cable over USB uh, between the two laptops. And this is actually how I did debugging. And again, for reference later, the, all the commands and information that you need for the ports is here in the slides. So the actual implementation, I mean, this was kind of the high-level roadmap, um, uses, as I said, core boot and grub. And let's see about some of the details. And um, Core boot, as I said, is, is an open source BIOS, right? So what I've been doing is um, I've been using upstream JIT head or even more bleeding edge, their Garrett review branches. So actually, if you normally think about, you know, development, JIT head is kind of like the bleeding edge, the latest commit. But core boot, they're actually very, very structured. They have a lot of reviews. So if you supply a patch, it will be reviewed and so on. And this basically ensures that the JIT head is always valid builds and it actually runs on all the laptops that they support. So they do build testing before allowing any commit into master and so on. But you still get really bleeding edge code. And um, <laughs> well, I should say, there's four or five of the core boot core developers are actually Germans. <laughs> so they're very pedantic about the source code and, and so on. It's actually very difficult to contribute something upstream. But you have a very clean uh, JIT master head this way. Um, and what I basically did is, if you read out from an original core boot, a Chromebook, the core boot flash image, because um, 
I should have said this earlier, Chromebooks, they run core boot in production, right? If you buy a core, uh, Chromebook off the shelf, they will have core boot on there. So the Google firmware team actually, or the other way around, the, the four or five core core boot developers have all been hired by Google into the Google firmware team. And now Google basically uses core boot in production. So um, all the Chromebooks, they use an open source BIOS with, you know, the caveat that Google open source isn't always really open source. It's GPL compliant. At some point, you can get the source code, but it's not like they actually contribute to the core boot upstream shit, right? But still, it's core boot on there. And this means um, because core boot can store the configuration in the flash um, that it was built with, you can also go to your actual flash image and extract the configuration from it again to see what options do I need to enable in, in the core boot build process to get exactly the same flash image. Um, the thing is, we don't want actually exactly the same flash image because we don't want to uh, build a vboot, the, the Chrome OS uh, bootloader. We uh, want to use Grub2 and so on. So you can adjust the configuration for your purposes a bit. Um, and there's, uh, as I said, for ref reference, there's all these commands in here again. Um, basically, what we want is four megabytes of this eight megabyte flash we want to re uh, reserve for our uh, own core boot parts and for our large Grub2 image that all goes into the flash. And of course, we remove all the Chrome OS specifics from the configuration, right? And then you can build core boots. It's literally like with make menu config, like building a Linux kernel. So if you have built a Linux kernel before, then this looks all very familiar. You type make, and um, even on the JIT upstream master heads, uh, you get a you know nice flash image that you can actually flash. So this is. Um, about, let's say, three hours of work, downloading the JIT from Core Boot, reading some documentation, and building your own Core Boot. It's all, all very feasible and doable. And then Core Boot has this amazing feature where you can uh, give it a payload, right? Because normally, a BIOS does two things. It does the hardware communication initialization, and it provides the BIOS services, which is in modern days, it's the UEFI services. In the old school days, it was called the BIOS interrupts that you maybe still know, you know, you can use interrupt hex 13 to, to display something on, on, on the screen and so on. Um, and Core Boot is only the first part. Core Boot does hardware initialization. It does not provide BIOS services. So if you want BIOS services, you have to couple Core Boot with CBIOS, for example, that you may also knew from QMU and so on. CBIOS is this, this uh, BIOS emulation for all the virtual machines. But you can actually run CBIOS on real hardware uh, in combination with Core Boot as well. Um, in this case, however, we don't need any BIOS emulation at all because we want to be booting our you know, secure Linux. We don't need any BIOS services for this at all. We just use Grub2 as payload uh, for Core Boot, and then you can actually build Grub2 into the BIOS flash chip. And then again on Grub2, uh, using upstream JIT head again, same policy applies. The JIT head always builds and is bleeding edge and so on. You invoke configure and telling it like our target platform is not actually like a normal PC bootloader. Our target platform is, is core boot. Then you can nicely embed it and use like one single command, grub make standalone, to create like a standalone grub and so on. And what you embed it in this uh, standalone grub is first uh, a configuration. Uh, a grub CFG configuration, normal grub configuration that will be embedded into the flash as well, right? And the other thing that you added to the, the grub flash image is your kernel signing key. So you can actually create a public key for, uh, for RSA with, with uh, normal GNU PG tools and export the public key of this and, and embed that into grub and embed that into your flash. So you don't have to do any esoteric OpenSSL X509 or whatever stuff. You can actually just use GPG to sign your own kernel image. Images. It's very convenient and, and very approachable for everybody. Um, and then you don't need to even be clever about what grub modules you include and, and don't include in your grub image because you have so much space, four megabytes, and the whole grub thing will be LZMA compressed. So you can actually build, like, take the full grub with all the features if you want and, and put that into your flash. Um, and then you can. Um, have a grub CFG in the flash image with what's called a super user configuration. So the grub CFG first, of course, loads your trusted signing key from, from the flash image, right? Because you want to be doing um, signature verification. Um, and then you, if optionally, if you have uh, lux encryption of your boot partition or full hard disk, you first do the lux, un lux unlocking of your, your hard disk. And then um, the next stage in the grub uh, CFG from memory is that it actually loads a signed grub CFG from the hard disk. And the, the idea behind this is so you have a second stage grub configuration that needs to be signed but can live on the hard disk. 
So the idea is if you change your kernel command line, for example, or the way you load modules into your kernel and so on, you don't have to go and flash a new flash image with an external programmer. You can change this kind of stuff on the hard disk. But the configuration itself needs to be signed, of course, to have a secure uh, chain of trust in, in the boot chain, right? And the, the kind of the super user configuration here is um, if any of these steps fails, it will ask you actually for a passphrase that you can hash with pbkdf2 with a lot of iterations so it's not easy to brute force. Or of course you can just disable this passphrase. But what I'm trying to say, it's not possible that if any of these steps fails that it gives you the grub rescue shell and then you can just load anything, right? <coughs> the next step is um, we want to have um, a secure root file system. And there's actually, even for that, there's a solution out there already that call, is called DM Verity. So um, the basic idea here is we want to have a root file system uh, for our Linux that is tied to our signing key, right? However, it's impractical to sign every single file in your root file system, obviously, because RSA is slow and so on. And also, it takes all these signatures take too much space. DM Verity is a, a hash tree over all the blocks in your disk. So um, basically, what you can embed then into your uh, configuration that loads Linux is the root hash. It's basically something like uh, a SHA-1 hash, for example, over your entire blocks of your actually raw block device, the underlying disk contents, right? However, building a hash over everything and verifying the contents of the entire disk would result in a very slow boot process. This is why they use a hash tree. A hash tree is basically you have for every raw block of your hard disk, you have a hash for this block. So you can verify the hash as you read the block. So you don't have uh, to verify everything in the beginning. You can do it at runtime. And it's uh, rather performant. And then the hash tree is basically, you know, different stages in the tree are then the hash above uh, about other hashes. And because it's a tree, you end up with one root hash that you can then embed in your command line. And the kernel command line is part of the signed configuration file. Like your kernel is signed, your init RAMFS is signed, the configuration is signed. So implicitly, the root hash is also signed with your GPG key. So by inference, the entire root file system is signed by your, uh, by your key. Um, again, here are the commands to, to compute this. And this basically protects your entire, uh, you know, root file system. Of course, this also implies that the root file system needs to be read-only because, you know, if you write to your root file system, you change the hashes and verification would fail, right? So you have to have a home partition, for example. Um, and in the setup that I use, um, I have a read-only root partition that is actually not encrypted because I, have, I don't need to hide what programs I use. I only want to hide my personal data from my home partition. And this is also a lot faster if the root partition is not encrypted. You don't have uh, all the battery drain and so on. And um, my home partition is encrypted and mounted no exec. So there's no executables that can ever be loaded from my home partition. Um, and all the executables in my system are on this read-only partition. If somebody was to have a, a local root exploits and mounted read-write again, then it's still verified in the hash tree. The next time I boot or the next time this is, this is being read, um, then the verification fails, right? So you get kind of also from, from remote code execution, you get some protection for, for persistence exploits. Of course, there is so many uh, uh, interpreters like Python and Bash and so on in Linux that this is a partial protection only. So an attacker could, for example, uh, drop something that is executed uh, at login, a configuration file that uh, executes a Bash script at login into your shell. But you know, at least you can protect against native code execution this way. Um, so this is kind of similar to the iOS, old iOS, I don't know, maybe six or seven models um, where you need to have um, uh, boot time persistence exploit uh, to get code execution uh, during boot to deploy some persistent malware if you don't have the signing keys, right? Um, and then a little bit on the binary blobs. Binary blobs is basically, you know, most, most modern hardware, uh, the vendors uh, supply you with uh, firmware blobs that the operating system needs to load at boot into the firmware of your different devices so they function properly, right? That's the firmware for the Wi-Fi drivers and so on. Um, but even even more firmware. Um, so 
the Chromebooks that I, I target here, they do require binary blobs generally to work. You cannot just make it work without binary blobs, right? And on all the tinfoil hats will tell you, but there will be, you know, backdoors in the binary blobs, right? And this is how the NSA gets onto your laptop again. I mean, that's, uh, from my perspective, that's not so relevant because the attack surface, except for the firmware for your uh, network equipment, of course, is a local attack surface only, right? So these could be relevant for uh, getting, for example, to SM uh, system management mode and things like this. Um, but it's not relevant as a remote attack surface. Um, part of these blobs are actually x86 uh, x code that is being run on your host CPU. For example, the um, VGA adapter, it needs to execute one of these binary blobs to initialize. Uh, it's called the VGA ROM, right, on, on boot. Um, and, uh, but that's x86 code that you can actually easily reverse engineer. Um, the Chromebooks also have an embedded controller, um, but again, the firmware there is open source, so you can audit it and, and build it yourself, right? Um, also, the attack surface again here is, is trivial. Um, there's no DMA, so there's no direct memory access from the embedded controller. All they can do on the embedded controller is because it's used for uh, hooking the keyboard metrics up to actually scan codes, they can do key logging. But you have no way to exfiltrate the, the data from the embedded controller except if you actually manage to pull off some, you know, uh, uh, radio communications over some wires. There was some Israelis doing some research on this recently. Um, and additionally, the Google VBoat code that is partially open source or, you know, um, ensures that the uh, embedded controller firmware um, is in a correct state. So you, this could be adapted, which I did not do yet. Um, there's a big secret thing about the intermanageability engine. Um, the intermanageability engine is basically an additional embedded controller that lives these days on the same uh, uh, package as your, your main processor. It's usually an Arc or Spark processor that does, you know, uh, power stuff and so on. Um, the Chromebooks come with a very small manageability engine firmware, which is really, um, normally you can have Intel anti-theft technology. You can have integrated lights out management and so on for servers in, in the manageability engine. Then you have an actual remote attack surface. The manageability engine in these laptops is really just for, you know, power uh, saving and so on. So there's no real attack surface. Um, and uh, even this is being reverse engineered by people, even though it's, you know, obscure and so on. And it's a separate topic. Igor Skochinski gave some, some talks at PECSEC, uh, I believe, about this. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's some research being done, but again, the attack surface is, for our purposes, not relevant. So there are binary blobs, but it's not a problem in my perspective. Um, so the last thing that I want to talk about uh, today before we get to some, some you know, demos and looking at stuff is uh, measuring and attestation. Um, so Richard uh, Stallman said at some point that TPMs, trusted platform modules, are a very evil thing. Nobody should support this. They are against free software and so on. Um, I actually believe this is not very good. Uh, uh, you know, policy because TPMs are really great for securing your platform. Um, that's why they're called trusted platform mod, uh, modules. But they were proposed partially by Microsoft. And uh, you can actually see that the uh, US government had a lot of their fingers in those. But um, it's not a technology that's imposed on people to control them or get, get access, but actually the US government wants them to secure their own platforms and, and make them more trustworthy. And it's pretty funny. Um, you can even find like the NSA's fingers in some open source and so on, I will show you later. Um, so basically, the, the trusted platform module is one single additional chip of the many chips on your mainboard, right? And um, it's connected to your main CPU over what's called the LPC uh, bus. So that's basically a laptop bus or a mainboard bus, and it can talk to your CPU directly. Um, the idea of trusted platform modules is that their updates uh, have to be signed, so they have proper cryptography and they have auditing of, of the firmwares from these and so on. But, of course, um, the, most of these companies and the signing happens in the US. So if your threat model really is uh, the NSA and so on, then you, have, you could be um, you know, paranoid about getting a trusted platform module firmware update uh, that's even signed but uh, still contains a backdoor. Again, the TPM has no D, uh, DMA and so on, so it cannot uh, be used to compromise your main system. But if you use the TPM to, you know, assure the integrity of your system, then backdooring it, of course, would allow them to uh, backdoor your system without you noticing, right? Um, also, TPMs by design are not hardened against physical tampering, so their, their threat model is always that you have to 
have your laptop in your own possession always, which is not exactly the, the threat model of this talk where we talk about somebody takes your laptop away at the border, right? Um, so hypothetically, you can decap them, uh, extract secrets from them, and so on and so on. But again, this is something that doesn't happen within three hours of your laptop being taken away. Um, and what you can do with a trusted platform module is you can measure your platform state until the system is being reset, right? Well, what's the meaning of measuring the platform state? The so-called platform control registers, which are 20 bytes long, which is coincidentally the length of a SHA-1 hash, so to say. And the host CPU voluntarily reports its current state in the form of SHA-1 hashes to the TPM. So when you boot, you can take a SHA-1 hash of the bootloader that you're executing. You can take a SHA-1 hash of the configuration of your bootloader. You can take a SHA-1 SHA hash of your kernel and so on and report these hashes to the trusted platform module. Uh, but instead of directly writing the hash into one of these registers, which is a write operation which is kind of loose, useless because then at any later stage any implant could write the correct hash into this register and you know simulate good state. You cannot actually write to these registers. You can only extend them. That's the name of this operation. Um, and this means you don't write the, the full SHA-1 hash into the register, but the, you report the new hash to the TPM, and then, then TPM takes the old hash from the register contents and the new hash and hashes them again, and the hash of this is put in the register. So the register content is implicitly a hash chain about all the stages that you have executed. So when you look uh, at, a, at the content of a register, you can never explicitly influence the content. You can only implicitly extend the state. And so you have kind of like a secure hash chain that then relates back to what stages you executed, but you can never explicitly influence this. And then the next interesting feature the TPM has is remote attestation. Um, which is basically a way to tell a remote party over an insecure channel like a network connection or even locally over an untrusted bus like the LPC bus because hypothetically somebody could be attaching wires to your mainboard. Um, you can attest the state of your current uh, platform. And basically what this means, it signs the current content of these platform control registers and the random nonce that you know the party that is being attested to generates and provides with a, a TPM-specific 2048 bit uh, RSA key. So if you bring your public key from the specific attestation key um, to some server, for example, beforehand, then you can um, travel around. And even if your operating system has been compromised in the way that every user interface you would use to look at the TPM contents would be modified to fake correct state when in reality you're compromised. You can then use on a remote server this, this uh, public key verification and it would tell you, well, this is actually not a correct signature on the state, so you could actually figure out you have been compromised. Um, so when I started out, uh, there was no uh, PCR measuring, no platform state measuring in core boot. So I worked with some uh, German other guy who was actually core boot long time developer on adding TPM measurements to core boot. Um, upstream, upstreaming uh, vboot already added TPM hardware support in general. So Google uses uh, in their Chromebook firmwares, they make use of the TPM. So the general hardware support was there, but there was simply no code that takes the SHA-1 digest of the different core boot and boot stages and reports this to the TPM, right? The code that we added in the ROM stage measures, measures the RAM stage. So before memory is initialized, um, you're executing with what something that's called cache as RAM, but this is platform details. Um, and basically what's being hashed is what's going to be executed in memory. So even if you assume somebody uses a PCI Express hardware implant in your laptop to access um, your memory at runtime and uh, change memory contents, um, this starts measuring before memory is even initialized, right? So you measure stuff before uh, the PC, uh, before DMA can actually do something bad to you. Uh, of course, PCI could then wait for the right moment to modify the code after measuring, but yeah. Um, and then the RAM stage measures all the PCI ROMs. So if you have like PCI uh, devices that have optional ROMs, binary blobs, these are being hashed. And it actually also hashes uh, and measures the payload, which in our case is GRUB2. Um, 
and uh, I did not modify the GRUB2 payload to do additional measurements because I don't think it's necessary, the signing key that you use for verifying the integrity of your kernel, of your, of your configuration and so on, is part of the payload. The payload is being measured by, by core boot, so implicitly your signing key is being measured by core boot as well. So if somebody was to replace a signing key in your, in your flash image with something else, with an external flash programmer, for example, all this TPM platform state would be changing because the hashes, they go wild as soon as you flip a bit, right? Um, and so you could actually um, see this. If you really think you need this, there's actually trusted GRUB2, which is a, a fork of GRUB. Um, I talked uh, to the GRUB uh, core author, uh, Vladimir. Um, yeah, I don't know. I can't pronounce the second family name, sorry. Um, and I asked them why they don't want uh, TPM support in upstream, and they basically follow Richard Stallman's Free Software Foundation that TPMs are evil and, and are used to oppress us. So there's, but there's uh, the fork of crop that actually um, has code to uh, do measurements. Unfortunately, it doesn't have the code to do uh, talk to the TPM directly, but it requires actually these boot services, uh, UEFI and BIOS interrupts an interface to actually talk to the TPM. So to support trusted GRUB2 fork, one would have to either extend core boot to provide these boot services, which core boot wouldn't allow upstream, or modify trusted GRUB2 to have support to directly talk to the LPC bus. <coughs> And what I wanted to do is using this remote attestation as kind of second factor in authentication. Um, because, you know, uh, I, I use SSH, right? You know, you have your IC shells over on SSH. You can use SCP to copy data um, to your laptop. And so I thought it's maybe a good idea to use remote attestation as second factor. So you have two factors. You have the secret that you possess in your home directory, which is an SSH private key that you use to log into your server. But you also use remote attestation um, to verify that the machine that you're logging in with is in a secure state, right? I mean, I talked earlier about remote attestation. And now you do remote attestation towards your SSH server to prove that the terminal, that the keyboard and, and the operating system that you're logging into is, is clean and so on. It's trusted, right? Um, so even if somebody, for some reason, is able to steal your, your private key that you, of course, only use for traveling, um, they will not be able to log into the machine uh, unless they have exactly that same platform state from, from your laptop, right? Um, so what I basically did is I implemented a TPM remote attestation with JSON as a transport um, because uh, the trusted computing group, uh, TPM software stack, that's what TSS uh, stands for, specifies ASN1 encoding with, you know, DER rules uh, as transport for generally remote attestation and so on. And if you have you know, followed in the last 10 years security advisories, you see ASN1 is a brilliant way to introduce uh, code execution vulnerabilities. So I did not want to use uh, ASN1 as a transport here uh, and not want to add stuff like this to authentication at all. And I wrote two simple tools that are also open source on, on GitHub now uh, called quote make and quote verify that are very simple, you know, command line tools. One is to used to make um, so a remote attestation the thing, the blob that you send for attestation is called a quote, right? Because you make a quote on the state of your laptop. Um, so this two, one quote make makes a quote on your local laptop and quote verify can then be used on a remote server to verify that a, that a quote is actually correctly signed and so on. Um, and this is then used um, to verify uh, to verify the integrity of your laptop. And I'm using uh, TCSD, which is a open source software stack for TPM implementation there. Okay. Another way to prove uh, uh, integrity, by the way, is TPM unsealing. Uh, this is some, some uh, third-party research I briefly want to mention from Matthew Garrett mostly. Um, you can also, uh, this is public key stuff, right? You can also, TPM can do symmetric AES encryption using your platform state as a symmetric key. And one brilliant idea that Matthew Garrett had is um, instead of incrementing a static secret that you would display for verification, um, which is very easy to shoulder surf, right? So if you have like an image that you decrypt and only if you see the right image, then you know your platform is in a good state. But then somebody can shoulder surf you off the image and then they can just replicate the image uh, when they implant you, right? But his idea was basically that you use a TOTP secret, like, you know, these, these uh, two-factor authentication, Google Authenticator and DuoSec and so on. So you encrypt the secret for TOTP um, with, with the current platform state and then you only 
uh, display the current uh, active valid six digits, right? And you have the same uh, TOTP circuit on your mobile phone, so you can compare the six digits from your mobile phone with what you're being shown on your laptop. And if only if these six digits match, which is very easy to verify because people are lazy, only then are you in a valid state. And nobody has a use of shoulder surfing you for these six digits because they change every minute, right? Because it's time-based. Um, but I like the, the public uh, key approach. Okay, before we get to the conclusion now, everybody asked me like, are you bringing an actual demo, right? Uh, let's see, you can see this, yeah? This is my hand, okay. Uh, so this is the laptop here. Now, uh, let's, this is the secure travel laptop. Now let's turn it on first. And if you watch the upper left screen corner, you will see briefly that Grub says hello to you. Uh, and I hope it works now. Uh-huh, laptop turns on. Ah. Grub briefly said hello, and now Linux is starting already. Oh, and I get a kernel panic, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's a demo effect. Yeah, there's, a, there's actually a, there's a bug in, in one of the firmware blobs. So uh, about uh, one out of four or five boots, you get a kernel panic at boot, which doesn't matter, then you just reset it and you boot again. And of course, this time I had to get the kernel panic. I bet I get another one now, Was just it because. Was ah, No, it wasn't. <laughs> okay, and now I'm being prompted for my... Uh, can you see my keyboard? No, okay. I want to see how somebody reconstructs my passphrase from my finger movements and vibrations now. That would be nice. And it takes a little bit because I, I take many hash iterations because I'm par paranoid. And now I'm basically unlocking my uh, home partition. And you see, you get a useful normal Linux. Okay, you cannot see the screen very well, but yeah. Okay, the focus doesn't work so well here. But uh, I, I will log in, and you have a reasonable normal laptop uh, with with a, with a GNOME desktop now, and you can work with that now, right? So this is this is a useful thing opposed to like a Chrome OS, for example. Um, and then the next thing I want to do is, uh, of course, first go to a terminal. and start a existing open source software that is called a TPM Manager and you can display the PCRs here. And basically you can see, uh, I don't populate all the platform registers, but these three are, have been populated by core boot now. And so the initialization state is all zeros and these hashes, they are specific to uh, what I'm booting right now, okay? So this is, this is the first thing, you can check the content of these hashes, but that is not very easy to remember, right? Um, so let's let's try a demo of uh, um, remote attestation. As you can see here, I have a, a network connection between my laptop and um, and this computer here. And I also, uh, as you can see, have some DHCP running. So if everything is somewhat working, I will get a lease now. Uh, of course it does not work now. <laughs> ah, the cable wasn't in really properly, okay. Okay, I'll put the microphone to the side for a second. to configure the host interface as well. Um, okay, this is not very interesting, just the HCP server. I have a connection now here. Um, I want to show you two things now here. Um, and I'm showing this on the screen because it's better to see them with the camera, right? Um, the first thing I want to do is do local verification. So this ThinkPad here also has PCR state. Uh, uh, and um, well, I can actually show you the PCR contents here. Um, Okay, 
this is a little bit harder to read. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the Lenovo vendor BIOS I have here, they populate much many more PCRs because they have much more external supply data that they're measuring and executing. And they are not very secure, but you know, you get a mo much more platform state. Um, so what I want to do first is uh, remote attestation over the LPC bus to the local host CPU, so to say, in case you don't trust your bus. And these are the two tools that, that, that I've wrote, right? Um, I want to verify a quote, and I have what I call like these expectation JSON files. So let's verify a quote first. And then you get an attestation request, right? Because this contains the nonce, the random nonce that's being signed, and the PCR registers. And uh, you copy that attestation request now to the quote make thing. You tell it, make me an attestation with this nonce. As you can see, TPM is really slow to sign stuff. But then you get your quote, right? And the quote basically contains now the uh, contents of these one hashes of the platform control registers the actual quote is you know um, contains a composite hash of these here um, and the nonce and some version information and then the actual RSA signature 2048 bit over over the quote and this is um, this is the quote and we can feed this uh, to our verification code and yeah, exit code is zero so this was fine. Um, now if I take the same attestation request or take a new attestation request but uh, for example uh, this time I will mess with the nonce. I need to be valid in base64 and if I slightly modify the nonce of course it will still use the nonce and give me give me a quote but if I then verify the quote for example um, the nonce in quote does not match quote verification failed exit code six and so on and I could you know arbitrarily screw with this now but yeah so this is basically nice because um, even if I don't trust the PCRs being displayed to me and in this this UI and so on um, I can still even if I trust the bus I can ask over a signature locally to my operating system um, okay let me log into uh, Connection refused. Okay, one second. So what I basically did, I SSH from this one to this one because then it's easier for you to see, right? And this is now the secure server that uses remote attestation as two-factor authentication, as we will see. Um, so now I'm trying to, uh, I need to start SSH server, of course. Okay, now, now once I SSH to the server, I mean, I can, uh, I can show you with verbose uh, output from SSH. I log into the server with my public key, but before I actually get a shell or can do something, I get uh, another attestation request from the SSH server. Um, and as you can see here on the shell, I'm on the Travel Plus, which is this one here. Um, I can use uh, quote make on this one again. Uh, oh. This is bad, yeah. Okay, um, I need to install a library, and for this I need internet. <laughs> so I will postpone the, the demo for a second. Are there any questions? Yes, that, that's a very good point. Okay, let me briefly explain the reason. Uh, because this one doesn't have persistent state, because the root system is read-only, I installed the library l last night, <laughs> but I rebooted the system instead of suspending it, so the library is gone again, and now I need internet connection to install the library, actually. So, yes, uh, security for the paranoid is also not very good for demos. I will do the demo at WhiskeyCon of the remote attestation. Basically, the idea is you have the attestation request, you do the same thing that I do locally, and you do that remotely, and then the OpenSSH server will let you in if you have a correct quote. All right. Um, let's uh, briefly do a, a conclusion and then I will take questions. There we go. So the conclusion, or well, the con contribution is everything I talked about um, is open source and there is a GitHub with a markdown readme that really has like a um, thorough walk through with uh, how you set up everything and even a step-by-step -step setup to replicate these setups, right? So that's public. Um, I, 
also in the same JIT repository all the scripts, configurations that I'm using, the code for the JSON TPM remote attestation under BSD license is, is public there. Um, core boots of upstream support for the C720 and C740 is a master now, so you don't even have to use my GitHub and trust me, but you can actually use the, the core boot JIT um, with the code that has been reviewed by the core boot team. Um, and the main conclusion is the trusted boot chain does not have to be expensive. Um, you can take one of these really, really cheap laptops um, um, a cheap flashing setup for less than a total of $30 um, and you basically end up with less than $150 to replicate this setup. Um, of course, you will be using a lot of open source software, right? Coreboot was there, Grub is there, um, DM Verity support and Linux is all there, right? So open source software use there is priceless. And I want to thank uh, Philipp Deppenwiese uh, for working on the Coreboot TPM support with me and Ralf Philipp Weimann for giving me initial inspiration uh, for this uh, requirement to have something like this uh, many years ago already. All right. Um, no, thank you first of all for your attention. Bear with me for the you know fair de demo, um, and thanks. Are there any questions? Yes, please. Oh, and by the way, I have a th first three questions get a free CrowdStrike uh, sticker. <laughs> so please, what's your question? Do, do you uh, want to wait a second there? Oh, oh the, sorry, has a oh, microphone sorry. already. Sorry, it's it's kind of a minor thing, but you don't authenticate your home partition. So are you worried about an attacker modifying that to, I don't know, change your presentation slides to like Goatsy or something? Did you look at like authenticated fullest encryption for that or saying that or anything like that? So if if you want to bring a static home partition without the ability to actually safe work, then you can just leave the home partition uh, you can encrypt your root petition and use the same DM Verity setup for your home petition as well. So that's trivial to adapt. You leave out the step of extra home petition, just leave it on the root petition. Then you have an authenticated home petition. But then you will lose all work or you have to save work on, on an external thumb drive, for example, right? Um, the encryption, however, um, the code that does the decryption um, and would have the ability to modify the contents at runtime would have to be signed, right? I'm verifying that the unlocking code and so on. So uh, somebody would have to have my passphrase to actually, uh, by shoulder surfing, for example, to do modifications to my full disk. But yeah, I, I want a, a writable partition on my laptop. Otherwise, it's pointless to bring a laptop for me because I do more than just surfing YouTube with it. And then again, the home content doesn't matter if you only surf YouTube. But yeah, you can do this easily with the scripts in, in the GitHub, please. So um, uh, your root partition is not encrypted. So uh, what if an attacker w would, n instead of modifying the disk contents, would reflash the firmware of the hard disk and uh, modify it in a way that after five minutes it will start giving out uh, bad binaries, for example? That's, that's the great thing about DM Verity. Every time an actual block is read from the actual device, the hash for that block is verified. Um, of course, Linux has a, a block cache in memory, so you know, uh, even with hard drives, you don't always read the data fresh from disk if you access it again, right? So if you assume a DMA attack that modifies the block cache in memory, that would be possible. But every time something is actually read from the disk, the hash is being verified. So instead of verifying everything at boot, you saw it was reasonably fast at boot, except for doing a lot of fashing of my uh, uh, full disk encryption passphrase. Um, it would, would take forever if it hashed everything, right? It only hashes data as it's being accessed. So you can actually not use a firmware attack in a hard disk. Anyone else? I have a third sticker. <laughs> oh, yes, please. Um, I guess this will help against some kind of hardware implants, but I can imagine it won't help against all of them. Yes, um, uh, as I said, if you have a, a, a PCI bus hardware implant that speaks DMA to your uh, physical memory, then the integrity of your system is so much compromised. I mean, um, stuff is still going to be verified by signatures, but you could patch the, the verification code in memory, for example, without affecting the TPM measurements and so on. So it does not help against DMA attacks. Um, the thing um, with uh, these mainboards is actually there's no exposed PCI bus. So to add a PCI hardware implant into this laptop mainboard, you actually have to very carefully drill into the layers of the mainboard to access the traces of the PCI bus, which is a very cumbersome attack. 
Um, and also, there's actually just not much space in, in these 10 things, right? So if you have a very, very flat hardware implant and you have the time to actually very carefully adjust the, the laptop under a drilling setup that doesn't destroy other traces of the mainboard, it is possible. This is, this is not like government grade. But th that will take more than three hours. Yes, exactly. So this is, this is not 100% tamper proof. But at that point, it's probably easier to just get a different laptop just looks like <laughs> yours. <laughs> So, I mean, what you could do is take a laptop that has been prepared and swap over the SSD so you still have the same repetition, but you have already prepared the other laptop, right? And, and at that point, I mean, if you, if you don't even know anymore what system you have in your hand, then you're kind of screwed anyway. And then again, the simplest trick there is, you know, my wife has awesome glittery pink nail polish, but uh, maybe it's not in pink, maybe it's green, I won't tell you. So, you know... <laughs> Uh, you have some, some you know, hardware uh, tampering pre uh, preventions. But of course, this is, this is an endless arms race, right? The basic idea is um, it's very convenient for governments at this point to take your generic Dell laptop, uh, provide an appliance and a manual for a customs border officer who doesn't understand shit about computers, just has this manual. Put this plug here, put that plug here, then you turn on the appliance and your laptop is implanted, right? That's, that's possible these days, and people sell these appliances, right? That's very convenient. As soon as you have it somewhat customized, you need some actual technician on site to do the implantation. And that raises bar so much. As long as you're not Osama bin Laden, you're probably fine. Yeah. Any more questions? Anyone? Yeah, I, I just use a travel laptop. I load it porn. And I, when I come to Singapore, it's in the circuit board. So. <laughs> Anyone? Last one? No? All right. Yo, thank you. That was awesome. Good. Very good.